Hey everyone! I know it's been a long time since I've done a live, but life has been a little bit crazy. We have been working so hard to remodel our house and move into it, and we did it, and the house isn't finished, but that's okay, but we're in our own home finally. So I've got a market this weekend, which is crazy because we just moved last weekend, but this is my last show of the year that I'm going to be doing. I didn't do too many since we're in a new area and life has just been really crazy. So I have one last market this upcoming weekend and I'm really excited about it. I feel like the December markets do extremely well because it's a lot closer to Christmas and people are in that buying mode, you know. So hi everyone, thanks so much for joining. If you have any questions about markets that you weren't able to ask beforehand, go ahead and just drop them in the comments below and I'll answer them as we go. But other than that, I have notes from all of the questions that you've asked. I wanted to do a live about this over a month ago, but the internet was not working for me. So I thankfully had taken notes and I still have all of them. So I'm able to answer your questions that you had asked me in stories or just through direct messages. Thank you for all those questions. I always love having a very specific topic to talk about going into a live video. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about why we're talking about markets. Um, I think that if you are a maker and you're trying to sell finished products instead of patterns or um, just content, like digital content, um, markets are the best way to get yourself out there um, within the community and um, just getting your name out there and you can also meet other local vendors and other makers and just become friends with them and it's it's like an, a community within itself even if it's not the knitting community. It seems that makers understand each other even if it's a completely different craft. You have respect for each other and just kind of have each other's backs. So at least for the most part that's how it is. Some people are real competitive and kind of cutthroat. but. That's not how it should be. So, um, I, oh, and it also helps you hear about future markets. That has been a huge resource for me. I'll chat with other vendors and ask them if they have any other good tips for good local markets. And that often works out really, really well. Mark, uh, makers, we tend to be homebodies. We tend to be more introverted, which is great. I have no problem being a homebody, but you know, being so involved in Instagram, it's such, you know, it's all virtual friends, which are very important. And I'm so thankful for the community that I have found through Instagram, but human interaction is also pretty great. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like somewhere between extrovert, introvert. So I really appreciate getting to see people and selling my items in person and that fills me up so much when I actually get to see um, see, a, see a customer pick out an item just for them and they just light up like a Christmas tree. That for me is just the best feeling in the world. Online sales are great, don't get me wrong. I still do a happy dance every time I get an order, but it's, it's a completely different feeling selling something in person and just seeing them wear it and it just fits them so well and I just love that so much. So those are, just a few of the reasons why you should consider doing a market. Yes, it's scary putting yourself out there and it's so much work doing a market because you have to set up your booth and you have to people and all these things. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's so much fun. Okay, I'm just gonna glance over my notes real quick and make sure I didn't miss anything. So you make friends. Oh, you can also meet um, owners of boutiques, which we'll get to later. Um, and possibly get your stuff into their shops. Um, but yeah, it's mostly just a great way to network with the community that you're selling in. And yep, I think that's the main reasons why I believe you should do a market. So this isn't my first live about doing markets. I think I did one last year, uh, also in December, but at that point, Instagram didn't let you save your live videos or at least I didn't know about that. So I wanted to do a second one and save this one and upload it to YouTube. That way everyone 
um, who asks me questions in the future, I can just send them the link to this YouTube video. So a little bit of history about markets. Um, it's not all successful. So I started in 2013. I was not Alabaster Pearl at that point. My shop was actually Twiddles Treasures, which sounds so ridiculous now, but uh, my mom calls called me Twiddles when I was real little, so I stuck with that name. And uh, I was doing not just knits, I was doing a really big assortment of things. I was doing handmade cards, um, t-shirt scarves, because they were all the rage back in 2013 and uh, just a, a hodgepodge of things but the knits were selling the best and so I pursued that and the next year um, was it the next year no I was still twiddles treasures for a little while so 2014 I had more variety of knits um, I had headbands and scarves and a few more baby items and um, the custom order started to roll in, which was really exciting. I was, um, I didn't have this account yet. I was just posting on my personal Instagram and Facebook, and I started to get orders from friends and family, which was very exciting. And then 2015, I skipped a market because, or I skipped like the one big market that I did in Oregon because I had a big wholesale order and the custom orders were starting to roll in as well. And the wholesale order just took up pretty much all of my prep time, so I wasn't able to do the market that year, which was fine. Um, it was a really good learning experience for me. So then 2016, I rebranded my shop to Alabaster Pearl. I felt like I had outgrown the name Twiddles Treasures, and I'm so glad that I rebranded because it feels much more grown up. And, um, you know, it's, it's definitely more my brand. And... Um, I just felt like it could take it more seriously. Twiddles Treasures just sounded childish and people were kind of confused by the name. So I, I, and I also felt like my knits were getting much better and had um, outgrown the name as well anyways. So then 2017, um, I challenged myself to make even more and every market was doing a little bit better. Let me back up. Um, I was doing basically one market a year because I was working full time at the coffee shop and I literally would prep year round because knits take a long time and I was also doing custom orders so I would prep year round for this one three day show that I would do in Hood River and it was an awesome show and I miss it. It kills me that I'm not doing it this year being in Texas but that's okay. Um, I really wanted to give it a shot here in Texas this year. and. Uh, anyway, so I, I did better and better each year at this one market, so I just took more each year. So 2017, I took about 70 items, and I sold every beanie. All I had left over was some random headbands and a few scarves. And then 2018, I took 140 items, which is double from the year before, and I sold about 85 items, which was over a three-day period. And that's the history of my markets. And now I'm starting over from scratch since we're here in Texas. We moved here in April and we've been remodeling our house and just moved in. Whew, it's been a, it's been a busy year. So it's terrifying and exciting starting over from scratch, but I really wanted to give it a good shot this year instead of just I had considered flying back up to Oregon and doing that one really good show because it's really good. And I could also use that time to see family and friends back in Oregon. But I haven't been in Texas with my family for Christmas since, what year is it, 2019, 18, so since 2016. So it's time to be here for Christmas, which I'm excited about. I can't imagine traveling after just moving. It would be exhausting. So, um, so yeah, I have done a handful of shows here. They've not all been good, and it's been a learning experience. So um, let me give a little blurb about that. I did one in October. It was a mildly well-attended one. It was in Alito, which is 
about 20 minutes from where we are and it was so sweet like the people there it felt very hood river it felt very um, shop local and support handmade and then I have done a few other small markets and they were complete flops I barely covered my booth fee which to me is like that's really important you want to cover your booth fee because <laughs> otherwise you're out time and money and yeah, so I've done, I think, two or three markets besides the one in October, and they've just completely flopped. So this next one that I have is back in Lido, that same town, and so I have really high expectations, and it's a very established market. So that's one thing that we will talk about in a little bit. Very important. I'm going to scroll through some comments. Hi, everyone who's joining in. Okay, I think it's mostly just people joining. Addie says, I wanna see your house though. Um, if I have time at the end of this video, I will um, peel the phone off of the <laughs> um, screen of my computer and give you a little tour. It's very uh, moving setting still. There's tons of boxes everywhere, so <laughs> it wouldn't be too exciting, but it does look really good. Oh. Oh, hello dear handmaid. Let's not forget that you brought lamps to a first timer at a dark market because that's the kind of person you are. Oh my goodness. So that year was, that was a rough market. Um, it snowed like two feet the day before our market and it was pushed back a day. And yeah, this was um, Shauna's first time attending that market. And it was a, it's a very dark um, winery and so she didn't know that she needed to bring lamps and uh, she lived like out of town and it would have been dangerous for her to go get it in the snowy conditions so i just brought her some lamps the next day and i miss her so much and you should check her stuff out because she just came out with some jewelry specifically for knitters and crocheters so check out hello dear handmaid she's lovely okay so i'm going to start I'm going to start answering questions that you guys have asked me. Um, so the number one question that I've gotten on my stories and direct messages is how to find markets. And this can be a challenge. It, it honestly depends on where you are located. Um, you can have, like there's no shortage of markets here in Texas. Um, I have, it's just a hard time for me deciding which ones to do. I don't wanna overexert myself. I don't wanna to do too many because it is an investment. Uh, most markets require um, money up front to reserve a space. Some, it's really rare to find a free one where they just want you to do, it's essentially um, a donation, like 10% of your sales goes towards something like the schools or, I did one of those in Oregon where, um, it was like 10 or 15% of my sales went to the local schools, which I was very happy to do because one, it's a great, it's a great cause. And um, it also meant no risk on my end being a free event. And so I, I would recommend um, if you are not doing any markets this year, attend them because then you can see if you have any competition, you can see how well the event is attended. I've done this a couple times. I've heard of some really good markets that I didn't sign up for in time and was able to attend them and I've already applied for them for 2020, which is crazy to me, but I'm very excited about them. So attend a market if you can, because then you can kind of scope it out beforehand. And you can also chat with the vendors, ask them if they've done the show before, how well it's going. Um, and also chat with them about like the fine print because sometimes the people, the coordinators will provide tables and, and linens and most of the time though, you're just renting floor space. So that means more work for you, um, but it is good to just be prepared. Um, get folding tables, get linens because you want to have you know a professional look. Um, let's see. So look online. Um, you can you can use Facebook really well for this. You can look at like events coming up because often it'll have suggestions for events that your friends are attending. Also, there are at least here in this area, there's several groups where you can actually join 
for craft shows. The one I'm involved in is like DFW area craft shows. So on there, people will post upcoming events that you can apply for. That um, that's worked okay. Yeah, some of them some of them were absolute flops from that, but also one of them was really good. So we it's just it's just a total crapshoot. So look online, ask friends. That's one thing that I've been doing here um, since I'm new to the area. I'm like, if you know of any good shows, please send me um, the info. And lots of people have been doing that, which is great, and I really appreciate it. And yes, so those are the best ways to find events, I think. And second question is how to pick a good market. I kind of touched on this. I think it's important to do as much research as you can beforehand. If you can ask the coordinator ahead of time if they know how many people to it, how many people they're expecting to attend. Because um, if it's if it's a really well established event, those are the safest ones. If it's a newer one where it's the first or second time, those are more risky because you don't exactly know how well it's being advertised. You don't know how well it's going to be attended. So if you can, if it's possible, pick the ones that are already well established, but those do tend to be harder to get into because they're more competitive. So you have to know about those ahead of time. And like I said before, attend the event the year before if you can. I know that's <laughs> that's like a lot of work looking ahead, but it can be worth it. So. What else? How to pick a good market. Know your area. You know, if if it's like a really small town, like really tiny, maybe don't do it. Um, one thing that I learned the hard way was never do a market at a mall. That was, oh man, I was pissed. I was so pissed. I wanted to pack up early and leave and throw in the towel. It was ridiculous. Um, I thought, oh, this is going to be great. It's the weekend. There's going to be tons of people there. It's a mall. But what do, what do you do when you're at a mall and you see a little kiosk in the middle of the aisle? You avoid eye contact with them. That's exactly what was happening. So people had no idea that it was like handmade stuff, even though I had that plastered in several places. Like, hey, this is handmade. Please come in and shop. Yeah, that was one where it was very frustrating for me and I just kind of had to suck it up and power through. Only thing that, there was a few things that redeemed that one. Um, I was sharing a booth with a friend, which was really fun. And then two people from the knitting community who I had never met stopped by just to say hi and meet me, which was so fun and I really loved that. Um, it just kind of, made everything better. I was like, okay, this was worth it. I'm so glad I didn't pack up early because I wouldn't have met them. So yeah, markets are not always great, but it's a learning experience. I always have to remind myself that like, okay, what did you learn this time? Just apply it to the next one that you want to do. All right. Question number three, is it better to have a color scheme, but lots of patterns or no color scheme and repeat patterns? I don't know. I do such a huge variety of stuff, so I think I think it just depends on your taste. Like I love the look of a really cohesive color scheme and then just doing like lots and lots of the same one. I love the looks of that, but I, I test knit for a lot of people and I have custom orders where they're random colors, so I try to knit with those leftover yarns. So I have a really crazy color scheme. Like there's no cohesiveness when it comes to the color schemes that I'm offering. But I know that Molly from White Owl Crochet Co, she has the like beautiful set of markets. It's total goals. She has this really cohesive color scheme and I love the look of that so much, but I know that I can never achieve that. I personally love to have a huge assortment of styles, of materials, of sizes even, because some people have giant heads with a lot of hair, and then there are people who have really tiny heads. So I do a really big assortment of things because everyone has a different shaped head. It's not one size fits all. How do you decide how much product to bring? So question number five. Uh, wait, I skipped one, sorry. 
<laughs> oh my goodness, this is kind of an inside joke for my mom. It's, do you make these beanies? I get that every time I sell at a market. Wait, you made all this? I'm like, yes, it says handmade right there. I, I made everything. Yes, I made all these beanies, so that's real fun. You'll get that if you ever sell your finished products. And Okay, so the next question, how do you decide how much product to bring? That's a hard one. Um, I think for me the biggest determination is the booth size, and not every booth is the same every time. Like I had one that was 10 by 10, I had one that was 6 by 8, the one I have this weekend is 8 by 8, and I've also heard some formulas that I thought was crazy and I should have written it down, but it was like bring a hundred times the value of your booth. Oh, I should have written this down. I saw it recently and I was like, well, that's insane. Like I could never do that. So um, there's no magic formula that I follow. I honestly just prep all year round and I try to have at least a hundred items for a three-day show and that's that was my goal every t um, the last few years at Royal Craft Revival in Hood River but um, yeah I'm not sure what to expect for this weekend so I've got I have probably 60 to 70 items and, an, and it's an 8 by 8 booth so I think that'll be pretty well filled I think that'll look good you don't want to have really sparse product for um, your booth space you want to like draw people in and a well filled out area um, tends to draw people in more <laughs> oh my goodness my friend Vikram asked me this and it made me laugh so hard that I had to put it in to the questions so question six how often do you throat punch someone for asking whoa that's expensive um, I've never throat punched somebody, although I've really been tempted to when they just don't understand how, you know, labor intensive knitting is and handmade items are. So, uh, yes, Vikram, I feel your pain. Vikram's a woodworker in Lubbock. I've never met him, but he does awesome products and he does a lot of markets. So he completely understands the pain of someone just completely insulting you to your face. You're like, cool. You're saying that my time is not valuable. Thanks for that. Okay. That's getting a little off on a tangent, so I'm just gonna move on. Question seven, how do you handle try-ons? I cringe at a market when a mom and two kids stretched out hats. Ooh. So I think it just depends on your preference. I know that some people are really weird about people, about customers trying on stuff, um, especially if you're using like really expensive merino wool and yeah, that I think if if I had nothing but like really luxurious product and I didn't want it to be stretched out, I think I would only offer a few items, a couple styles in like one size fits all and then have samples essentially. Like, okay, this is the only one that you're allowed to try on of this style as is this one and this one. So that's one way to handle it. Um, I tend to be kind of like a helicopter parent when it comes to markets. I see someone enter my booth and I'll like, <laughs> not snuggle up to them, but you know, I'll, I'll saunter up to them and give them a spiel. I'm like, hi, thanks for coming in. Um, everything here is handmade and you're welcome to try anything on because I have such a huge assortment of things. I want people to actually try them on because one size doesn't fit all. and. Um, I, you know, tell them there's a wide assortment of things. Um, if you, oh, and then I, I tell them about my palm bar. I generally don't attach palms on hats beforehand because I found that they're harder to store when they have palms and people freak out over being able to customize their beanies right then and there. So I give them like, there's a, a bullet point of, of things that I like to go through. And, um, but I also tell them like, um, when they are trying something on, I, I have seen people like put headbands around their hands and then just stretch the crap out of it. So I try to tell them like, okay, when you're putting it on, don't stretch it too far. Um, I always tell people it's only going to get bigger. The, the item that you're trying on is only going to stretch. It's not going to shrink. So just be mindful of that when you're trying it on. Don't, don't stretch the crap out of it, please. 
thanks. <laughs> One of a Kate. Hey, I'm wearing the same shirt today. Yay, our maker life. Yes, I have very red ears because right before Mark, um, right before live videos, I get super nervous and I get really cold, and then my body tries to like counteract, and uh, my ears get incredibly red. So if someone was saying. Oh, okay. Sarah says it was someone saying bring a hundred times the price of the booth. And when I first read that, I thought she meant um, items, but I that still to me is really crazy. Um, so say that the booth this weekend is $125. So does that mean I'm supposed to bring um, Ten that whatever whatever that is that's that's an insane amount of product but then someone was saying maybe she meant the value of your product um, should be a hundred times the booth fee I'm really bad at math so the booth that I had in Oregon was two hundred fifty dollars so I should have I'm gonna write this down because. I know that's simple math, but I'm afraid I'm going to ruin it. So, <laughs> so 250 times 100 is 25,000. So according to that formula, I'm supposed to bring 25,000 items, or did she mean $25,000 worth of product, which is still insane. I think the most I ever brought, including Marina Wool Blankets, was, it may have, may have been six, or $7,000 of product that I took to a market. And that was with my, uh, that was last year with, um, how many items did it take? 140 items. That formula to me is absolutely insane and should not be followed like by knitters anyways. Maybe someone else who can batch products could fulfill that, but that's just nuts to me. How do you put on the palm so quickly? I have a lot of practice. Um, I have the palms ready to go. They just tie on. Like I have my darning needle ready to go and it's literally just tying a bow and a knot and then I snip the ends off. So they attach in like less than two minutes. Super simple and very effective. People love it. Oh, I, I still think she messed up and meant 10 times and not 100. That would be more achievable, but that's still pretty crazy. Um, I, yeah, I've never followed a formula that I've seen. Okay, so last question was how to handle try-ons. Okay, inspiration for market setup. All right, my first few markets were so bad, so bad. I will share stories of them, or I will share photos of them in my stories just to show you how far I've come. Um, my original inspiration came from other vendors at that market that I was at. Um, it was called Rural Craft Revival at the time. And my, my favorite setup was Future Folk Supply, and I will also share them in my stories. They have just this beautiful aesthetic, and they're such fun people, and um, they played with their um, vertical space a lot. So it's like, wow, I should be doing that. That's really smart, instead of just laying your stuff flat on a table. That is so boring and it doesn't draw people in so I learned real quick to play with vertical space especially since space is very limited in booths um, so yeah just don't lay your stuff flat out on a table super boring play with the height as much as you can and so other inspirations for me are grandma skills knits and knots um, I'm assuming it stands for Winnipeg um, White Owl Crochet Co. Heisel and Ivy Company and SLP Made. So I will I will share a bunch of those photos in my stories, and then I will save them to my highlight feed that is market setup. So there's so many amazing kids out there who do a beautiful job with shelves, which I really want to do, and like faux walls. It's just amazing. Right now, my game is like it's okay. It's okay for what I have, but I really want to step it up and have faux walls and because if you don't have something even like curtains blocking what's behind your booth, it's really it, it gets lost because there's often other vendors behind you and there's just stuff going on in the background. So 
visually it's so professional if you can at least have curtains set up if not faux walls and the faux walls would be really nice because you can actually use them as shelves or put hooks on them and store more product which would be fantastic okay question number nine do you put out all of your items it depends on the space that I have if and how much product I have I I do since I have such a huge assortment of stuff but if you're only making like four beanies and offering um, or if you're making like one style and you're offering four different colors I would say don't put everything out at once because that could be overwhelming um, just put out a few of those items and then replenish as needed but it depends on the space and it depends on what you have so I'm sorry there's no magic formula um, question 10 how can one ensure a successful market so there's no way that you can guarantee that you're going to sell everything or even well because you can't guarantee that shoppers are going to show up like I learned at the mall there were shoppers there but uh, they weren't there for me they weren't there for handmade <sighs> that was so frustrating so I say do your research and um, also just be positive and because I was really like in a downward spiral at that at that mall like I said, I almost packed up and quit because it was very frustrating. But I was like, no, put on your big girl pants and you go stand at the edge and you like make eye contact with people and draw them in. It didn't really work, but I at least felt better that I put some effort into it. So do as much work as you can to prepare and um, label everything and you know just make your, your space look as professional as possible so that you can be really proud of your work just do what you can. You can't guarantee shoppers are going to be there, but at least you can be proud of your product. Um, question 11. I saw the mirror and I thought, oh, duh. Why didn't I think of that? What are some other must-haves? And this is my favorite stuff to share with people um, that I've learned over the years with markets. So have a mirror, make sure to have business cards. The very first one that I did, I did not have business cards, which was very silly. Have a shop sign with your name, even if it's handmade. I still have the original Alabaster Pearl sign that's on a chalkboard. It's, it's like this big. I eventually would like to get, you know, a vinyl sign that looks a little bit more uh, professional and can be hung behind me instead of getting lost in the display setup because right now it's it's just in the display setup and I love it like it's near and dear to my heart I don't think I'll ever get rid of that item but I think a banner above would be really professional and really good make sure to have gift bags because that's really important and make sure to stamp your bag with your logo so that as people are walking around it's advertising your stuff and if you have care instruction cards, put those in the bags ahead of time so that way it's just whoosh, ready to go. Pop the item in and hand it to the customer and you're set. Have change for cash, have a square reader or some sort of card reader because I sell more in card sales than I do in cash sales every time, no matter what. Um, if you need a square, referral code if you haven't signed up for Square already um, send me a message and I will give you my code you will get a thousand dollars off uh, or you'll get a thousand dollars free processing and I will also get a thousand dollars free processing and it's good for 180 days and then after that you have to pay I'm not sure what the percentage fee is now it's either three percent or five percent but hey it's gonna get you more sales so it's very much worth it make sure to take water Speaking of which, I'm going to have some. Make sure to take water and some snacks because markets tend to be pretty long and you don't want to be hangry. Take a chair or sometimes they're provided by the person coordinating the show. And make sure to wear good shoes because you're going to be standing on your feet all day and you don't want to be cranky. Um, make sure to ask whoever's coordinating the event about tables and linens because like I said earlier sometimes they're provided by the person and but often they're not often you have to provide it yourself I recently invested in a cart 
to help haul everything in and it makes setup and breakdown so much easier. Um, I, yeah, I, it's just kind of silly. Those are things that are total game changers and you don't think about it until you see another vendor setting up and you're like, oh man, that's awesome, I need that. So get a cart, it really helps. Bring a friend. I highly, highly recommend bringing a friend. It makes the day go by so much faster, especially if it's a crappy market. <laughs> um, it's more fun to share the space and it also cuts your, your booth fee in half and if one of you has to use the restroom, then your booth isn't left unattended. Or if you forgot something, they can go get it for you. It's just really nice to have a second person there. Or if it's a great show and it's really busy, then they can help people with checkout. Um, order forms. So this one isn't super necessary. I rarely ever get a custom order at a craft show because people are usually there to buy what is in front of them. But every once in a while, I'll, I'll have a custom order, which is really nice. If you do that, make sure to get paid in full ahead of time, like there at the market. I have, it's essentially one on top and one on bottom. It's filled out the same. They get a copy and I get a copy and you can say paid on it. Um, it's yeah, super important that you get paid in full in advance because I the first time that I was doing the custom orders forms there in person, I didn't take payment for one of them and made an item and they never picked it up. So I totally got stiffed on that one. So get paid. Okay, next item, lighting. As we talked about earlier and that really dark winery, lamps were really needed. So it just depends on the space. Sometimes it's a really well lit up space. It's really nice if you can set up the day before and see the space and then you could set up lighting. But um, sometimes you just don't know. So take lamps if you can. Or if anything, like little twinkle lights can really add some coziness and also just a little bit of extra light. Okay, I've got a couple more comments here. Oh, that's a really good point. Okay, Sarah's twist says, what I did was I told people they can stroll around the aisle and then pick up their items so they're not sitting there waiting for me to add their palm. That's a really good, really good thing to say. Um, if you're attaching a palm to someone's hat, you can just, yeah, tell them to, oh, you can stroll the aisles, but if you feel like it's taking a little bit longer, but um, yeah. Tents for outside markets. Great question. I have never done an outside market, but if I ever do, I definitely will have one of those pop-up tents because you just can't predict the weather, especially here in Texas. Um, it's 70 degrees today. It's the first week of December. and um, But sometimes, you know, it's like 20 degrees and having an ice storm. So weather is really unpredictable. I, tr I tend to not want to do an outdoor market because the weather's so unpredictable and it's really windy here sometimes and I like I said I play with the vertical space so I use a lot of crates and I would just be terrified of something getting knocked over and one breaking something ruining some of my display or product or even hurting somebody so I tend to just do the indoor stuff but if you feel like there's an outdoor market that would be really good for you to do definitely get a pop-up tent Okay, next um, next item, so lighting, phone charger. I take a phone charger and I also take like a battery pack charger so that I don't need an outlet to charge my phone because often it's hard to find an outlet at markets. And um, also take extension cords. So mannequin heads um, or just a mannequin in general, since I'm selling mostly hats and headbands, I have a lot of mannequin heads um, for displaying them because, you know, play with that vertical space and I almost always sell the items directly off of the mannequin heads. Like people see it being worn like, oh, I want that. I want that. That's real nice. So, um, so yeah, have as many mannequin heads as you dare. And then I have one freestanding mannequin that is always wearing a scarf and sometimes I'll just put a hat on top. It doesn't look as good as a mannequin head but 
it's at least displaying something. Freestanding display items. I'm confused by my own. Oh, so like freestanding mannequin is great. Um, I have a little sandwich board that's um, I change every time I have a market, so it you know it's specifically for that market. It's nice if you're gonna have um, like a blanket display, maybe have a ladder that doesn't need to be propped up against the wall. A freestanding mirror is really great because you aren't necessarily gonna have something that a mirror could prop up against. And yeah, I think that's what I meant. <laughs> Take gum because you're going to be close talking with people and you don't wanna scare them off with bad breath. Take a knitting project. This is one of my favorite things to tell people because it always draws customers in because you're working while you work and it lets them see and know that, oh my gosh, she's knitting. She made all this stuff. And it's just a great conversation starter. Even if someone isn't going to come in and buy a project, it often starts up a conversation. And I'm, um, yeah, I've, I've had such, such lovely conversations with people who knit themselves or like their grandma knitted and it's just a really sweet spot in their heart. And yeah, it's just a great conversation starter. And if the market is really slow, then you can, you can at least still be productive, which is great. Power strips or heaters. Yeah, if you're gonna be outside, I think heaters is actually a really good idea. Power strips, extension cords, things like that. Um, a generator would probably be overkill. Generally, electricity is offered at markets. Um, if it's an indoor one, they often ask you if you need electricity ahead of time, like if you are gonna be selling food and you need a fridge, things like that, or if you're selling um, lamps, or I'm trying to think what else would need power, or if you're selling a diffuser, if you're selling essential oils, things like that. If you absolutely need electricity, you often have to tell the coordinator. I don't usually need electricity unless it's a super dark corner, but I have like battery powered Christmas lights that I just keep in my, my bin of helpful tools for markets. Okay, so knitting project, super important, but also smile, just be friendly. I know it's super scary to like put yourself out there and um, extrovert, because most of us, like I said, are introverts. It can be so scary, especially when it's something that you've made and rejection feels terrible because you've made this item, but generally people are super great and are actually really impressed with the fact that you made all this stuff. You know, they're, they're just really impressed by that. So have fun, smile, you wanna draw people in, because I'll see vendors that are just like, not trying to talk to anyone, I'm like, come on. I just want to go over and shake them on the sh by the shoulders be like, just talk to your people who are coming to your booth. Like, ah, they're walking away and you're just letting, you're just letting them walk away. Okay. So that's all the questions that I had about markets. Here's a few other random things that I thought were worth mentioning. And I've already mentioned one of them is to attach palms at the markets. I usually have a few palms freestanding, um, like just dispersed through the, the display, which can look really weird because it looks like a triple and it's just sitting there randomly on the table. But I'll usually have a, a little cluster of them and I have a sign next to it that says, attach a palm for seven extra dollars. And, um, and it just lets people know like, oh, I can customize it. And then I usually have some by the register checkout spot if I can have a register checkout spot. Sometimes space is too limited to do that. And uh, yeah, so I'll just let them know if I am chatting with them that they can attach a palm and customize it right there. And people love that. Because I, the first year that I was doing a ton of hats, I did combinations of pom-poms and I had so many people say, oh, I'd buy this hat if it had this pom-pom. I can change it for you. <laughs> so I, I just love letting people customize their stuff right then and there. Okay, something else worth mentioning is um, you need to think about this ahead of time and which one you wanna do. So you can either do price tags on each item individually. Oh shoot, I was gonna grab some. Um, my tags are about this big. They have my brand name in them and then on the other side it has the price tag and it has the fiber content. 
care instructions, and one other thing. Oh, lay, lay flat to dry. So if it has wool, I'll mention like 20% wool, 80% acrylic, hand wash, dry flat. And then it has the price tag on the side. So the first few years, I just did signs and like headbands, $20, um, scarves, uh, $40, whatever it was. And um, after, after years of working in customer service, I've learned that people don't read. So I got really sick of pointing to signs. And um, so I now tag every item individually. And it's multi-purpose because like I said, it has the fiber content on it and the care instructions, which is really nice. And so it is more work to do the individual tags. You have to make the tags and then you also, or order them. And you also have to attach them to the item. The signs are a lot easier if you have a small enough option of product that you're offering. That's the other reason I started tagging items individually because I'll do like a shorter version or slouchier version and the price is different. So it really just depends on what you're offering, but know that if you're gonna do signs, generally people don't read and you need to point out the sign to them. And that annoys me, so I stopped doing it. And for other reasons, I started doing the tags. Um, so I don't often have a bunch of baby items at my markets because it's such a specific thing. And usually people ask if I have any kid items or baby items and I tell them no, but I can do a custom order. And so that's something you need to consider if you want to offer kids items or not. And, but yeah, like I said, it's so specific, like it could be a girl or a boy and it depends on their age. and so many different things. So I pretty much just don't offer kid items because it's very, very specific. Um, I also have a bin full of market stuff. Inside is um, tape, which has come in handy multiple times, zip ties, extension cords, shims, because I use crates and sometimes floors are uneven. I keep straight pins for um, specifically, oh my gosh, linens, tablecloths, that's the word. Sometimes I want to make it drape a certain way. Um, I also have fabric for just adding some texture on the tablecloths if needed. Um, also, if I'm ever using a box, like a, an ugly cardboard box to play with the height, then I can cover it with some fabric. So I've got some burlap in there. I have um, a faux fur pleat and, a, and also some random like plaid fabric. So it can add some interest to your setup and also just cover up some eyesores. Um, props, what did I mean by props? I don't remember what props are. Um, mannequin heads, I have two that just stay in a box so that they don't get smushed because they're the foam ones. So they've got like some gashes on them and I, so I had to put them in a box so that they wouldn't get any more damaged. Um, I also have a lot of little chalkboard signs um, and so I keep chalkboards and chalk pens in my market bin. What else is in there? Um, if you are going to be doing linens, it can be nice to have either an iron so that you can like press out any wrinkles or um, one of those steamers, a clothing steamer, I don't know. Anyways, one of those things. I don't remember what it's called, but that's okay. So um, I'm trying to think what else is in my, my box. I have a backup square reader randomly in case mine ever breaks and that just lives in my bin. Um, yeah, I've got a mirror that lives in there. I've got, oh, props meaning like I have stands. So if um, I have a little sign that needs to be propped up and it keeps falling over, it can live in that. So I also have a cute little letter board where I can adjust the sign every time at a different market. So if I wanted to say something else, I'm not needing to deal with chalkboards. So those things all live in my bin as well as the Christmas lights that are battery powered like I mentioned earlier. Okay. Um, Oh, we only have 10 minutes left. Oh my goodness, I've been talking so much. So that's pretty much everything for markets right now. I'm going to touch briefly on boutiques because they tend to be a little bit similar. 
but it's about you know marketing things. And I recently got my stuff into boutiques um, locally here, and I had a ton of questions about it. So, and but that same day, I was having a lot of technical issues, and Instagram kept deleting my stories and was uploading them out of order. It was really frustrating. So. Um, I had also done a fill-in-the-blank question thing that people could send me questions. So the number one question that I got was, how do you even ask? And you just you just do it. Um, I think this is really intimidating for makers because, like I've said before, they tend to be introverted and it's so scary to put yourself out there and face re possible rejection. And it's the same with markets. like you're putting your heart and soul into these items and possible rejection is just heartbreaking and really intimidating but I think that it's so important that we do it because one it gets our name out there potential sales and it's just good to market your own stuff and then also just don't take things so personally and that's so hard to do when it's such a personalized item that we're making and just a handmade craft, you know, our heart and souls go into it. So you got to put on your thick skin when you're going in and tell yourself that your identity does not, does not depend on what the boutique owner says, whether they accept it or reject it. So um, I think it's, I think it depends on where you're at. Um, so I have my stuff in two different markets. One I approached them and the other one I met at a market here locally and she said that she didn't have any knitted hats and she wanted my stuff in her boutique. So that's how I discovered her. And then the other one, I did my research and approached them. I actually emailed them because they were like a half hour drive. So I wanted to see if they were interested before I dro drove all the way out there. And yeah, so we'll touch on that in a little bit. So how do you even ask? You just you just do it. You just get out there and ask them, hey, I'm a, I'm a knitter, I'm a crocheter, and I'm wondering if you wanna carry my products and take some stuff in there and just try to be as like pleasant and smiley and nice as possible, but also confident and um, Take your stuff and be really proud about it. You know, the fact that you made something with your hands is something to be very proud about. How do you present your work to boutiques? I think that's pretty much very similar. Um, I will. I would recommend going in in person. I think that's the best way to get your stuff in there because it's harder to say no to someone's face than it is over the phone or over email because it humanizes you, you're right there, and um, the fact that they can see the product would be an even bigger chance that they would want to carry your stuff. Um, do you offer your products or did they ask you? So like I mentioned earlier, it's one of each where one approached me and then the other one I approached them. So that's one pro about being in markets is that usually boutique owners will shop at these handmade markets and they're often looking for vendors to bring into their offering. Um, pros and cons of consignment. So, pros is it's a sale. Cons is you're having someone take a cut. So one of the markets, or sorry, one of the, it's called the market where my stuff is at. Um, they take a 30% cut. So I honestly just bumped my prices 30%. And if it and if it doesn't sell, it's, it actually doesn't cost me anything because they don't have a monthly rental fee. Some places do. And then um, this other one, she has a $75 a month fee, but she doesn't take a cut. So when you do put your stuff into a boutique, make sure to read the fine print and ask as many questions as possible and basically interview them because sometimes they have hidden fees, you know, they will pass off the credit card fees to you. Um, sometimes you have to do your own display. Sometimes you have to work in the place or sometimes it's an option to work in the place to pay off your monthly fee. But sometimes they require it that you work at least one shift a week, which is crazy to me. Um, and 
sometimes they take a cut and sometimes it's just a monthly fee and then sometimes it's both. So just ask them what the deal is. Like I said, basically interview them before you put your stuff in into their boutiques. Okay, wholesale versus consignment. So I generally shy away from wholesale because it's so much prep time. It is a guaranteed sale though, that's the thing. And you're selling it at such a huge discount. And I think that people often expect massive, massive discounts with even handmade stuff. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a bulk provider. Like I'm still having to make every single item by hand. It's taking the same amount of time if it was a custom item. But the thing is, it's a bigger chunk of money because it's a guaranteed sale. So you really have to figure out what's best for you. Like if you do a ton of custom orders, don't do wholesale. If you are struggling to get your custom orders up and going, do a couple wholesale accounts. Just get your stuff out into like a local area and see if they sell. Or it will sell because it's a wholesale thing. Consignment is, um, it's, it's also kind of a risk because you're still making the item, but it's not guaranteed to sell, but you get more of, you get more money per item. So it really just depends on how much time you have on your hands and like what, just what fits best for your lifestyle. Okay. Um, call drop in or email. So drop in, I think is the best calling. I think email would be better because then you could link your Instagram or your Etsy or your Facebook, whatever your website is. You could link it in the email and they could click it and see what you offer, which is great. I think call is mm, bottom of the list. So drop in email, then call. How does it work? Do they take a cut? We've, we've kind of touched on this already. It honestly depends on the boutique. So just ask them what their percentage is because sometimes they take like 50%, which is so crazy. So you just gotta ask boutique itself and see what fits best for you. Okay, I've, um, yeah, I've got like three minutes left. Okay. Do you do paper receipts? Um, I do if they have that custom order, if they're doing cash, I've never done a cash receipt unless they ask for it. Um, if you have a square, it'll ask them after they sign if they want a receipt or not. Tags help too. People who are socially anxious, um, if I don't see a price tag or no, I don't ask and I run away in panic. So price tags on your items are great because yeah, if you are scared to ask how much it is, then it, it's easier to find. Uh, um, yeah, I, I am a big fan of, of price tagging each item individually. It also looks more professional. And if they're giving it as a gift, then your brand name is on it, on the tag. And the care instructions. Do you stick to one shop per town? So I have one here in Weatherford and then another one in Mineral Wells, which is a separate town. Yeah, I, w I wouldn't wanna do more than two per town. It just depends on how big your town is. Okay, all right, that's it, we're caught up. Sweet, we're down to the last two minutes, so I think I'm just gonna sign off. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, thank you for your questions. That always helps me have more to talk about because I hate when I get scatterbrained and start rambling. So this will be on replay for 24 hours. I'm going to save it and post it to my YouTube channel. If you have any other questions, if you're watching on the replay, feel free to message me and I can answer it in stories, and I will also be sharing other market vendor setups that are huge inspirations to me, and I'll save those in my highlighted reels called Market Setup. Sweet. Thank you so much, you guys. You're the best. We'll see you next time.